Hello and welcome to session three of the AIM North America webinar series on FISMA 204. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping notes I want to go over. First, you'll notice you are muted throughout the presentation, but if you do have questions, you can send those to us via the Q&A option at the bottom of your application screen. We'll also be recording this webinar and all participants who registered will be notified when that recording is available via YouTube. On the next slide, I just wanted to note that there are 46 days away from the publication of FISMA 204, so we are very happy to have you here to learn about standards for identification and data capture. Now I'm going to go briefly over some AIM slides, and so our next slide is on our antitrust policy. It's the policy of AIM North America to conduct its operations in strict compliance with the antitrust laws. No AIM activity shall create even the appearance of a violation of the letter or spirit of the antitrust laws. And on our next slide, we have uh, our collaboration and work product policy, and this states that AIM North America Webinars like today's are held for the primary purpose of advancements in our industry, which necessarily involves development of work product intended solely for the public domain. AIM North America has developed this policy for the protection of its members who engage in this important collaborative effort. On the next slide, I uh, just want to introduce our speakers here. Today we have Jeannie Duckett, Senior Manager of Traceability and Transparency Technology with Avery Dennison, Phil Archer, the resident web geek from GS1, and Chris Brown, RFID subject matter expert from TSC Printronics. Jeannie, I believe you're going to start by reminding people of our prior two sessions, which are available now on YouTube on the next slide. Yes, thank you, Mike. And I just wanted to say I'm really happy to be here for this session. We have some excellent speakers today talking that are going to talk about AIDC, 2D barcodes, and RAIN RFID. On the screen, you see our FISMA tool for a webinar series. So far, we've had two sessions. For those people on the line that don't wear, that this is an ongoing uh, presentation. Those two sessions are recorded up on YouTube if you'd like, if you didn't attend to them and you'd like to listen to the information. We talked about the fact that we're really entering this age of regulated food traceability. Regulated food traceability started back with the Bioterrorism Act of 2002, legislating one step up, one step back traceability, and continues to the FDA FISMA 204. And then the second session, was really just a quick start guide to FISMA 204, what you need to know and what you need to know in this first 60 to 90 days of enactment. Uh, next slide. Today, we're gonna talk about what the key data elements are and how they relate to AIDC. So very simply, a key data element, which you're gonna be required to provide to the FDA within 24 hours of notification, is information associated with what's called a critical tracking event for which a record would have to be established and maintained. This includes harvest, shipping, receiving, transformation, and all these events have key data elements associated with them. And these key data elements include things that must be shared with trading partners, and they include basically global data about that product and then shipment unique data. And then there's also data elements that would be held internally. Remember in FISMA 204, you're really responsible for the business events that you have control over. Your receiving events, your transformation events, and your shipping events for your particular role in the supply chain. Next slide. So on the screen here, you see an excerpt from the upcoming uh, published regulation. And this is an example of data attributes for what some people call master data, defining global unchangeable attributes about a product. So, you know, it's your product identification code, your category of what it fits into, your brand name, commodity name, product name, size, style. These are things that are always going to be true if I'm buying watermelons. The first time I buy watermelons and if I buy the same brand of watermelons, they'll be true the last time I buy the watermelons. So these are really considered master data records and really are shared outside of, you know, your shipment and receiving events. Next slide. 
And then you have like this instant level data that we're going to talk about and focus on today's session. Instant level data is either information that describes a particular lot of food. So say I have a group of watermelons or in some cases for high value items, an individual item of food. And it contains variable data information on that, and it needs to be shared in a real-time or near real-time with the shipment. And this information includes things, well, obviously you need your identification code, but then your quantity of your shipment, your lot number of your shipment, the date that it was um, shipped, the date that it was harvested, and relevant information that defines that particular group of food. Next slide. So, and you think about that, well, that's, you know, pretty easy to do because I had this conversation a couple of years with somebody, for those of you that don't realize, I actually grew up in Iowa, very close to the agricultural community, and I was saying, you know, we really need to establish this traceability, and they're like, well, Jenny, of course we have traceability. If I grew food and took it to the local grain elevator or to the local uh, auction, they paid me for it. So obviously they knew I had the food. So, so let's say I have a grower and let's explore this concept a little. So say I'm a grower and I'm growing watermelons. And I decide to call my watermelons, one, two, three, four, five. They're my watermelons. I have control over it. I have control over my records. And then I'm going to distribute those watermelons to somebody. And then say we have another farmer, farmer B, he's growing potatoes. And he decides to call his potatoes one, two, three, four, five. Now, certainly, if I'm farmer A, I know that I grow watermelon. And if I'm farmer B, I know that I grow potatoes. But our supply chains can be long and complicated, even if it's within the United States, and about 20% of our food supply chain is not global. So, say I'm a retailer and I ordered one, two, three, four, five, what exactly am I going to get? Am I going to get watermelons? Or am I going to get potatoes? And this is this concept of globally unique identification or this traceability. And this is why a lot of times people call these internal numbers like stock keeping units you'll see or price lookup codes. And these are basically internal numbers that generically describe a, build, a product within one company. And what you're looking for is to be able to describe that product such that anybody that looks at that identification code globally can understand what that product is. Next slide. So this is where you come into this concept of standards-based traceability. And there's really three legs to this stool. In standards-based traceability, you have this system of how you identify and you create these global unique identifiers. Then you have a way that you capture that data and with fill and Chris, we're going to talk a lot about how you capture these data carriers today. And then you have this concept of how you share this data. So remember, for all your products, for my watermelon, I have attributes that don't change, and then I have harvest-based attributes. And this session today is going to focus on that instance level or lot level information that changes. The next business tool for our webinar on October 6th is going to discuss that item attribute data sharing of that master data. So here you see your identifier, and you start to see this global trade item number. Now, one of the powers of using a standard such as the GS1 global trade item number is it's guaranteed unique. And then we're going to talk about how you can share that G10 in a data carrier, whether that data carrier is a linear barcode, a 2D barcode, or an RFID tag. And so with that brief introduction, I just want to review what AIDC is and why we do it. So automatic identification and data capture refers to machine-readable identification that contains that unique identifier and perhaps some attributes about that item. There are many, many different AIDC technologies, and it really got its start actually prior. The most famous start is the UBCA barcode scanned in 1974, but it actually got started back in the 60s. 
So AIDC is all, covers many different technologies, and it basically refers to anything that captures to a computer without human intervention is AIDC. And the rise of computing in business processes really necessitated the development of AIDC data carriers. But there's other reasons. Humans are very good at creative tasks, but they're not so good at repetitive tasks. And so I've shown that when human beings are keystroking in information, about every 300 keystrokes, you get one error. And so now that we've talked about the two different types of, or a couple different types of AIDC carriers, you know, you have your barcodes or your optical symbols, and you have your wireless data carriers, such as RAIN RFID, I'd like to pass this off to the resident geek for GS1 Global and have him discuss to you a little bit about data carriers. So I'd like to introduce Mr. Phil Archer. Thank you, Jeannie. Hi, everybody. I'm very pleased to meet you, and thank you to AIM Global for inviting me today. It's lovely to look down the list of attendees and see all those names of people I haven't met before. It's always a pleasure to meet people I haven't met before. Um, there's only one name I have met before, so hello, Merle. Um, GS1 is, um, I think, I guess this audience knows, we're the, the, the people behind the identifications um, numbering system that gets put into these barcodes. And as Jeannie says, the one that's most famous is the UPCA uh, EAN barcode that's been around since the 1970s. And that does give you a uh, class level product identifier. This is a watermelon from a particular place, but it doesn't give you all the information you want. And we are in the middle of a big revolution at GS1 in working towards um, a day when that um, a venerable 1970s technology can be put out to grass and replaced by some form of two-dimensional barcode. Why? Because we need more information. If you're going to do food traceability, you actually need batch numbers, and sometimes you need serial numbers, depending on what the item is. You probably don't need a serialized number for every watermelon or every potato, but you do for um, electronics goods, white goods, things that have some sort of persistence. Um, uh, serial numbers are important for things like um, deposit return schemes. So you only return the deposit once. Batch numbers are really important for stock control. Earlier on today at a GS1 event, we heard from German um, retailer Metro talking about their system where they use expiry dates to automatically discount goods, uh, that is fresh foods, as the expiry date approaches. So for a very good reason, we need more data in the barcode, whatever the barcode is, whether it's one of these optical ones or um, a radio frequency tag of some kind. More and more processes demand more information. Next. <clears throat> The problem is there are lots of different types to choose from. These are all different types of two-dimensional barcode. And it isn't just the choice of symbol, it's also the way the data is encoded. Let's start with the first one, next. This one just contains those three bits of information. I've chosen these three as my example. I could have included a serial number. I could have included a measured weight or a price or a dimension, all sorts of things we can include. But for the running example throughout this presentation, I'm just going to use those three data elements, the GTIN, the trade item number, the batch of that particular trade item number, and the expiry date. And those three bits of information are encoded in that two-dimensional, what we call GS1 data matrix, um, in a very efficient way. It's designed to make that thing as small as it can be, um, and it does give a very efficient transfer of data, which is understood in the world of AIDC, in the world of scanners and printers. And it's being used at point of sale today in places like Woolworths, which is a big retailer in Australia, um, 7-Eleven in Thailand, uh, Colroot, a big uh, supermarket chain in Belgium, and other places too. This move from the traditional one-dimensional barcode to a two-dimensional barcode is underway, and some people are choosing to use that method of encoding those numbers uh, in that string. Next, please. The problem is, when it comes to consumer interaction, it's not always enough. You and I now routinely understand that if we don't know the answer to a question, we can look it up. Whip out your phone, you can find out the answer to any question you like. And when you're confronted with something you might want to buy, where did it come from? How was this grown? Is it grown sustainably? Has any rainforest been destroyed to make this food? What do my friends think of it? What can I do with it? Um, if it's a non-food item, 
where can I get accessories? If it's a physical piece of infrastructure, who installed it? When was it last maintained? Where can I get spares from? At the back of the stores, is this first in, first out? Is it the oldest one and should go out on the, on, on the shelf first? Lots of questions that you have. Basically, you want to ask the thing in front of you. Can I do that somehow? Next. The problem is that what you've got here is an example, actually, of a one-dimensional barcode, but it's got all that information in it. This is technically a GS1128 barcode. And those same bits of information are there. There's the GTIN, there's the expiry date, the um, uh, 25th of December 9, uh, uh, 2022, um, and the batch number of A, B, C, D, E, F. The reason for them being laid out that way, I don't need to worry about today, but it is a very efficient way. But that's all the information that's in there, just that. Now, hand that to the average web developer and say, OK, that's the information you've got. Now build your app, build your system to tell me where this thing came from. Next. They're not going to have a clue because these guys don't understand this. They're not AIDC experts and they don't know what this string of what looks like random numbers can possibly be. Next. So what we have is this thing called the GS1 digital link syntax. This is a way to take exactly those same bits of information, that globally unique identifier, the trade item, the batch number, the, ex the expiry date. Again, I could include other things, but I'm just sticking with my example. And this is a different kind of syntax that looks a bit more familiar to people and is increasingly understood by optical scanners. Every scanner manufacturer we know, literally everyone we know, is working on recognizing this syntax and building it into future point of sale systems. And the important thing is it does contain exactly the same information as those weird looking strings and that you can extract that without having to make any kind of online lookup. This is being used at point of sale today in um, Brazil, Shopwell Paladetti was the first one to use it, uh, apparel manufacturer CNA in Europe, um, New Zealand, a thing called Swapper Bottle. There are other places using this throughout the supply chain today. Next. But you know what? You probably noticed it's a URL. That string of characters, that GS1 digital link string is a URL. And you can do a lot with a URL. Next. Stick that in a QR code <clears throat> and anyone can come along and they can scan it with their phone and be taken to more information about that thing. Well, you see that quite a lot. You see QR codes on things, you see people scanning them and they get information. But if you use GS1 Digital Link, then you can do even more because it's got those identifiers in it, because it has a specific structure, so specific that a computer can be programmed to extract the expiry date, the batch number, the whatever it may be. And we can go even further than that. That straight line from the thing to the electronic information Let's see if we can make that a bit more special. Next. We have a little, you know, service, something in the middle there that we can potentially use as a way to um, get more out of this two-dimensional code than we have today. Next. Because if my application adds to that URL and says, I want the sustainability information, that little service, thing we call a resolver, will automatically then redirect you not to where it was going for the basic product information, but specifically to information about sustainability. Next, you can feed if you want to, you can ask specifically for the product information and you get that next. But you can ask for it in a particular language. So imagine you're selling um, uh, in Florida and you want to make sure that product information is available in both English and Spanish, then you can do that because that little service, that blue dot, can take that information and make sure that it returns the right information for that user. Next. And if we talk about things like physical assets in the building, well, we can look specifically for maintenance information as opposed to installation information or anything else we might want to get to. Next. That GS1 digital link syntax does everything that older style barcodes do. It has the same information in it. It's got those globally unique identifiers. And the structure of that string of characters is very, very precisely defined so the computer can recognize it, take those identifiers, and do something with it. And the domain name, the internet domain name, doesn't matter. 
That's important because it means that you can use the brand owner's own domain name. You look at a product and um, you know, and you've got the product name there, and you scan the QR code, and that's going to take you to somewhere else you've never heard of. You're going to scan it. Yeah, you might. You might not. If the domain name is actually the domain name of the brand, you're going to feel much more confident. And you can use any domain name for this because the globally unique identifiers are the GS1 identifiers, not the internet domain name. Last thing to say before I shut up and take questions is that um, we recommend that you actually set up a subdomain for this. This string of characters identifies the physical object. So you want to logically separate that from the different sources of electronic information. And it's much easier to manage that if you set up a subdomain, we suggest ID dot, but it could be anything, somewhere where basically a different department can manage the physical identifiers. And that can be a different department from the people who manage the marketing website or the promotions or the recipe ideas or the whatever it may be. So in 10 minutes, that's all I can cover on GS1 Digital Link today, but um, there should, I hope, be some questions or I may have prompted some ideas that you might want to ask about. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Phil. This is Chris Brown. I'm with TSE Printronics Auto ID. Uh, Phil has been talking about barcodes and digital link, uh, barcodes as a data carrier. I'm going to talk about RFID as a potential data carrier. Uh, it's important to understand that barcodes are not going to go anywhere. They're not dying out or anything like that. So barcodes and RFID are really complementary data carriers. Now I start up with this slide here, the importance of standards. That's really the overarching theme today. As Phil talked about, uh, if we're using standards, then company A can encode data and a completely different company B can decode that data and understand it. I have here on the slide, the classic bottle of Coca-Cola. I can take that bottle of Coca-Cola to the checkout counter at Walmart, Kroger, 7-Eleven, Chris's Cantina, anywhere, and we can all scan that barcode and resolve it to company is Coca-Cola, and the item is, let's say, 20-ounce bottle of Coca-Cola Classic. So all of this has been made possible for decades by barcode standards from GS1 that have been in place and they have served us wonderfully. But now with the evolution of the food industry and other industries, we're starting to need to expand our standards and improve them. Uh, next slide, please. So as I said, I'm gonna talk about RFID as a data carrier. Hopefully everyone is familiar a little bit with RFID. It's a wonderful data carrier because it's very fast accurate, very low error rates. Uh, note, we do not need line of sight to read the items. Touchless, we do not need to get right up next to the item. And we can do bulk reading. With the single push of a button, I can read hundreds, even thousands of items. In the lower right here, you see some data, some statistics. Those are data from Auburn University's RFID lab. I won't get into the specifics of the data, but the general point is that when RFID is used as a data carrier, we get substantial measurable improvements in accuracy and functionality. Uh, next slide, please. Now let's say that we're going to use RFID. Uh, we've decided, hey, RFID is great. I want to use it. Then comes the question of, well, what am I supposed to encode to my tags? If we go back to our Coca-Cola bottle barcode example, Coca-Cola knows which barcode symbology to use and what data to encode to that. But for RFID, we're still a little bit in the Wild West. Uh, we are in discussions, we have GS1, we have the FDA, we have representatives from the food industry, uh, we have t RFID technical people, we're all in discussions and we're all working on this question of what should we encode to the tags. Now in the GS1 world, that 
question is answered by what GS1 calls EPCs or electronic product codes. And GS1 has a standards document called the TAG data standard, which answers or which provides many different what they call encoding schemes. So they have an encoding scheme for encoding your basic UPC barcode and adding in a serial number, for example. And we'll get into that in a little more detail later. GS1 just did a major revision of this tag data standard document about a month ago and published it. And it this new revision is very relevant and important for the food industry and FISMA because it introduces some new encoding schemes meaning what do we encode to the tags that are very helpful and potentially will be one of one or more of them will become the de facto standard for what we're encoding to tags on food items. Uh, in the little table down at the bottom, the second column from the left, we see some of these example EPC schemes. The first one, SG1096, you may have heard of that one already. That is the most common encoding scheme in the world. If I go to Walmart and buy a pair of Levi's jeans, they will have an RFID tag on them with an SG1096. But in this new tag data standard 2.0, GS1 added in some new encoding schemes, such as the SG10 plus, the DSG10 plus, and the SSCC plus. And then, as I said earlier, these are potentially very important for FISMA and food traceability. Now let's take a little deeper look at the older SG1096. So next slide, please. So here we have this, I'll call it a traditional SG1096 encoding. Again, this is what you're gonna find on the jeans and sweatsuits at Walmart and so on. In an SG1096, well, at the top, you see the GS1 element strings. In the top right, we see one of Phil's 2D barcodes there. And in that barcode, we have encoded the G10, a serial number, batch lot number, and in this case, an expiration date. We could have other elements. Uh, we could take some of those out, but those are the elements we have in this barcode here. So in that top line of text, I show the different element strings that are encoded and we have color coded them to make them easier to decipher and extract. If I look at the traditional SG1096, it only covers two of those element strings, the G10, which contains your company information and the item information in yellow and green respectively, and it contains a unique serial number for that instance of the product. Uh, down at the bottom is just a sample encoding of this data in hexadecimal. And you can see that it uses 96 bits of EPC memory. That's why it's called an SG1096. Uh, next slide, please. Now, remember that the SG1096 is only encoding the G10 and a serial number for us as the key data elements. So if we are looking at food traceability and FISMA, we also need other data elements. We need access to those other data elements. One possible approach would be to use, for example, an SG1096. In the bottom left, I have my package of items. I've put an SG1096 tag on there. That tag tells me the G10 and the serial number but then I have to go off the tag to a database somewhere to get my additional product attributes, such as expiration date and batch lot number. That's not necessarily a bad thing that I need to go to the database for that data, 
and it's not necessarily a good thing. It's just one architectural model that can be put into place. Uh, the next slide, please. Now with GS1's new TAG data standard 2.0, I mentioned earlier that they introduced some new encoding schemes, some new EPC encoding schemes. And two very important new EPC encoding schemes for the food industry and FISMA are the SG10 plus and the DSG10 plus. I wanna break those down a little bit. Uh, the G10 portion of those names means that you encode the G10, the global trade identification number, which is basically the company and that company's specific product, such as Coca-Cola and Coca-Cola classic 20 ounce bottle. The S means that we add a serial number to it so that we uniquely identify that specific bottle of Coca-Cola. Not a good example, but you get the point. And then the plus means that we can add in as many data elements as we wish. We can string more and more additional data elements into the encoding, such as expiration date, uh, batch lot number, which would be the two key ones, but we could have other things, for example, best before date and so on. The D in the DSG10 plus means that the encoding prioritizes a date field. I won't get into the technical details here, but depending on where the data elements are in, a, in the sequence in an encoding, they can be more or less efficient to read, easier or harder to read for a reading system. So with the DSG10+, we put the date up near the front of the encoding, and it makes it easier for reading systems to search and filter on the date field. I may be very interested very often in expiration date. So I might use that encoding scheme so that I can easily search for and filter on products that are expiring on a specific date. Now, if we go back to the barcode in the top right there where we have our different data elements, and then the first line of text, we have broken down those data elements into their element strings and laid them out nice and clear. And then at the bottom, we see two sample encodings. Uh, in hexadecimal format. And again, we can encode all, none, or some of these data elements in this encoding scheme. The first encoding, I have the G10, I have the serial number, and I've also put in the batch lot number and an expiration date. And it required, in this case, 160 bits of EPC memory. In the second encoding, I've only done the G10 and the serial number. And I was able to do that with 96 bits of EPC memory. So conceptually, you might think there's no difference between the second encoding and our SG1096 example, but you will notice that highlighted in yellow is the G10 element string. And you will notice that in the two SG10 plus encodings, that element string of the G10 remains intact and in one position. Again, very technical, I don't wanna get into it, but if I do this in an SG1096 encoding, the G10 portion gets broken up. The company portion and the item portion get broken up, and it's very difficult for a reading system to extract the company portion and the item portion and put them together. So with this new SG10 plus encoding scheme, we keep the G10 intact and make it very easy for reading systems to read. Uh, next slide, please. Now with the SG10 plus and the DSG10 plus, we are starting to put more and more of the key data elements directly on the tag itself. This means that I can 
configure my reading system to very easily and efficiently search for and filter on attributes such as expiration date or batch lot number. Searching on those fields is not impossible with an SG-1096, but the searching needs to take place on the external database with an SG-1096. With these new encoding schemes, the searching and filtering can be done in the logic in the reader or even logic through the reading commands over the air protocol, we would say, the air interface. This is all very technical, but it means that I can very easily, quickly, efficiently search for a specific attribute using these new encoding schemes. Uh, next slide, please. This slide is basically a table that outlines the previous SG-1096 approach and the, S, the new approaches of SG-10 plus and DSG-10 plus, sort of the pluses and minuses of each approach. Uh, the first row, how much memory is required for that encoding? Well, with an SG-1096, I only needed 96 bits. With the new encodings, uh, roughly 160 bits. But again, it's variable because I can encode more or less. Second row, key data element access, meaning where do I go and search for the key data elements? Well, with an SG-1096, many of those key data elements will not be on the tag. So I need to go to a database to find those key data elements. With an SG-1096 or DSG-10, excuse me, with an SG-10 plus or a DSG-10 plus, I can put those attributes on the tag. Again, by having them on the tag, I can much more easily and quickly filter for attributes of interest. Uh, the third row is what I talked about with the G10. Uh, in the SG-1096, in the encoding, we break up the G10 and put the company part and the item part in different sections. So a reading system has to be very smart to extract those two pieces and put them together to get our G10. But in the new encoding schemes, the G10 is all in one location and very easily decipherable, readable. Uh, the last row is what I've already talked about. It's much easier to search for key data elements with the new encoding schemes. Next slide, please. This is basically a rah-rah for RFID. RFID is wonderful. Uh, on the left, you have your grower, your manufacturer, all the way through the supply chain to the consumer on the far right. Uh, if we can all agree on this encoding standards to use, and we all implement those encoding standards, then we can tag items at the grower or manufacturer and follow them with the same reading systems implemented by different trading partners all the way through the supply chain up to the consumer. So we will not only be able to much more easily adhere to FISMA regulations, but you, the food industry, will be able to leverage all of the benefits that RFID brings for you throughout the supply chain. And that is it for me. I'm going to pass it back to Jeannie for a wrap up. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That was very informative. So as we wrap up our session today, the one of the things we always want to keep in mind are there are really truly benefits to feed traceability. As Phil mentioned earlier, several of us were in sessions today listening to people and governments around the world and the UN talking about what they are doing and how they're leveraging food traceability to meet business objectives. And some of those objectives could be lowering the cost of waste, strengthening your band equity, and as Philip talked a great deal about building that consumer trust. And then for governments, governments really have two objectives when they implement or set up requirements for food traceability. 
One is they want to enable a fair, a, a fair playing field for their companies. So if they want to make sure that everybody is playing for, by the rules. You know, we all consume food, and the United American, and I've heard it said very, many times, the American food supply chain is very safe. And there's only a couple bad actors, and pretty much everybody would like to know who those people are. And the other thing they want to do is protect the public health, facilitate trace back, trace forwards, and minimize recall time. So I'd just like to give one more plug here for our upcoming sessions. We have some really good ones. The next one is going to be with Julie McGill talking about data capture and data sharing. And then we're going to have scaling from pilot to rollout. And then right before the publication, what five things can you do now to get ready? So I'd like to thank you guys for your attention today. Thank my co-presenters, Chris Brown and Phil Archer, and ask if there, anybody has any questions. Yeah, thank you, Jeannie, uh, Chris, and Phil for your insights today. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, we do have a few minutes for uh, Q&A, so I'll just get started. Uh, and this goes along with, uh, Chris, a little bit what you were talking about, and that's, can I create a digital link with an RFID tag? Yes, you can, uh, but I need to turn that over to Phil. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm not too knowledgeable on digital link. Phil? Well, it, the, the key thing to bear in mind is that the identifiers in a GS1 digital link URL are the same. So whether you encode those identifiers in an RFID tag or an optical barcode, it is that same information. So think of it just as an alternative syntax. Now, if you want to convert from one syntax to another, you're going to need some software to do that. Um, so, you know, the the, the path to doing that, I, I would imagine, is, is obvious, but um, you would need software to, to do it. But it is it is programmatically easy. So Chris's answer that the, Chris's answer of yes is correct. Um, but you do need to process the information that comes off the RFID tag to turn it into a uh, GS1 digital link URI. Great. And uh, Chris, this was a question directed to you. you uh, is this the same as EPC extended attributes? Um, I'm going to presume that this means adding in the additional data elements like in an SG10 plus or DSG10 plus. And I would say the answer conceptually is yes, but you need to be careful with the language that people use because people have traditionally used the term extended attributes when talking about storing those additional data elements in user memory using the packed objects approach. But conceptually, yeah, it's the same thing. You can add more and more data elements in other words, extended attributes into your encoding. And that, that's a really good answer, Chris. I just like to add one comment to that. The GS1 US Food Service Group had an, an extended attributes work group last year that focused on a fixed length RFID tag of 198 bits. And as Chris mentioned, the TDS 2.0 that was released this summer is a variable length standard that can fit if you just do a, a G10 and a serial number in 96 bits, or then the more attributes you add, the more data it will take naturally. Thank you. And then uh, we had another question. Why is digital link a more powerful concept than a traditional barcode? Aren't barcodes linked to databases already? Yes, but only one at a time. Um, and only you know, in the store. So the barcode that, that goes beep at the checkout, yes, that thing that goes beep is connected to that store's database. But what GS1 Digital Link allows you to do is to make it easy to interact with your consumers, with your business partners, um, and you can interact in different ways. Again, it's the same identifiers, no matter how you do it. So if you have an app or some other system that already reads um, those identifiers, you can ignore the fact it's a URL and simply extract the identifiers and go what and do what you're going to do. But your consumers can point their phone at it and they can get something. And that makes a difference. All right, uh, we will end with that question. If there's any more questions or comments, uh, you can reach out to AIM North America here at our, uh, at the 
address is provided. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank uh, Jeannie, Chris, and Phil for their time and insights today. And I'd like to thank the audience for their active participation as well. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.